I'm Dr. Michael Latola. And I'm Megan Strong. In this week's Case of the Week, we take a look at what might be a slippery Bruxer Bridge. And parents, put your dukes up. We've got an epic battle between brushing and broccoli. And a dentist writes in and wants to know, just because six tenths of a millimeter is the minimum thickness for Bruxer, is it necessarily the best thickness? That and more on today's Chairside Live. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 130 of Chairside Live. Megan, how are you doing today? I'm doing swell. Nice jacket, I like it. Thank you. This is kind of styling. This is part of my, my clinical mentor, uh, Gordon Christensen, mm -hmm. has a lot of different colored sport coats. I don't know how many, but I've seen at least seven shades of green alone mm. that he wears. And so I figure I need to start branching out and get a little more... A little flashy, a little like more it. colorful. Yeah, the guy in the Canali store kind of picked it out and said, this looks good on you. I'm like, he's just trying to sell me a sport He is, coat. but it looks good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> he is, and it looks okay as well. <laughs> no. Well, you look nice and black today. Thank you. A lot of people at the Hinman Dental Association asking, at the meeting, mm -hmm. asking where you were, and I'm like, I can't drag her out here to these events. She's got a young and at home now. She That's true, but I think we need to take Chiricide Live on the road. You think so? I do. Like a hundred date tour? No, not necessarily uh, that. Just a weekend. A little ambitious, the 100-day yep. tour. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, well, we'll see about that. Maybe just start at the CDA meeting in, uh, in Anaheim coming up in a couple months. Sounds good. Uh, we got a great episode for you today. We've got an interesting case of the week. It's about the Bruxer Bridge that wouldn't stay on. You naughty Bruxer Bridge. In fact, let's take a look at that now. This was a bridge that uh, kept coming off, a Bruxer Bridge. Uh, and it wouldn't stay on, and now the dentist has uh, reprepped the case and took a new impression and sent it back into us. Here's the impression. Um, we can see the margins, which is nice, but you've probably you probably know what I'm going to say already that we're not big fans of three unit bridges in plastic double arch trays like this, or even metal uh, double arch trays. And that's just something we've learned from our own remake rates and from Gordon Christensen. We do see to see, do seem to see a lot of bridge remakes. Uh, higher than normal when they're taken in double arch trays like this versus a um, you know full arch maxillary impression here of the preps, a full arch uh, mandibular impression, and then a bite registration. So it limits us uh, a little bit what we can do. Let's take a look at the models for this case. And you can see it's a kind of a funky bite here. We definitely have uh, class three tendencies um, over that distal abutment on the bridge. And even here, that tooth is kind of tilted out, but it's almost an edge to edge. When we look at those lower anteriors, you can see all the wear that's been going on there. In fact, it looks like that uh, pre-existing uh, central incisor here, tooth number eight, had done a lot of damage to that lower anterior. Perhaps it was an old PFM crown that just kind of chewed through there. Because when you look at the wear compared to the anterior teeth, we definitely see more on that, but could just be the wear pattern. But certainly, this is somebody who's done their fair share of uh, bruxing in their uh, 76 years of life. And so, bruxer's a good choice here. You know, a three unit anterior bridge, the first thing that might pop in your mind would be an Emax press bridge. Except for the fact that Emax is contraindicated in patients who brux, so really, Bruxer is the right choice. In fact, anterior Bruxer uh, would probably be strong enough for this, but uh, if we are in fact worried about fracture, uh, regular Bruxer, which is what the doctor prescribed, would go in here as well. So this is going to be a tricky one to do. There's enough reduction there uh, to do a Bruxer bridge. The connector height, we're going to have to make sure it's rule of 27 compliant, but I think you can see already that uh, that's a pretty big dimension if we go from where the tissue is here down to here we've got at least five millimeters so and in the anterior uh, the rule of 27 um, is actually a little bit overkill compared to the posterior where it's actually mandatory because of the much higher bite forces uh, in the mandible we can see um, well you can kind of see if you look at the uh, solid model you can see there's a flipper so it doesn't really engage uh, at all. It just kind of sits on the lingual of this and there's no clasps. There must be some wrought wire clasps uh, in the posterior. And these are the new preparations that the, uh, that the dentist did. And uh, we always look in terms of retention. There's a couple things going on here. There's the fact that zirconia is more difficult to get a good bond to than say a traditional, um, you know, sub traditional ceramic like Emax. Zirconia is a little trickier. But then we also just have to look at the prep length 
um, itself. You know, we talk about short preps, long preps. Usually, you know, four millimeters is what we use as kind of a cutoff uh, for making that determination instead of just using using words. And it looks like we have four millimeters there. It looks like we have four millimeters there. We definitely have uh, four millimeters there. If we uh, look at the lingual, that's a really nice prep. That's a really nice prep. Look out, see how the uh, gingival third right here uh, goes straight up and down instead of just, instead of this concavity um, going all the way down to the gingiva that we see a lot. This wall right here, the way the doctor has prepped that straight up and down on that gingival third uh, is going to give us some mechanical retention when it opposes this wall on the facial. So it's really nice when you're able to do that. Um, most of the time when I lecture or do hands-on clinics on the reverse prep technique, we talk about not using the round burr here unless we have a high cingulum. And in those cases, if we have a low cingulum, we just use that 856-025 burr so we can develop this vertical wall. This is the only mechanical retention you really get on an anterior tooth preparation because the rest of this is going to be done uh, as a concave preparation with a football burr. So nicely done. Big margin, a margin that's you know deep enough, this, this kind of deep chamfer or shallow shoulder uh, would be adequate for Emacs. Emacs, unfortunately, won't be tolerated in this situation because of the parafunction habits of the patient. So could have been for Emacs, but Bruxer does not mind a deep margin like that as well. We look at the margin here, and it's a little deeper on the facial and the lingual, and then it gets a little thinner here, but it's not even, it's a mild... A uh, shallow chamfer here and a little shallower here, but not even a feather edge. So Bruxer will be okay with that. If we take a look at the height on this prep, this is where we see we're going to have some issues. So I can imagine this bridge being in place, not really having an issue here on the central, um, but it's over here on the lateral where we're going to have some issues. So if we measure this, yeah, see we're at about two millimeters right there. Here, that's a little tougher to measure because look how tapered that wall is. So if you look at it and draw a line across from here, from the top of the prep over, you go, yeah, we've got three, a little more millimeters there. But this whole part of the wall is pretty non-retentive. Um, the whole prep kind of slants that way, but we're really not getting much retention except for in this bottom one, maybe 1.5 millimeters there. A little better on the facial and um, on the lingual. Again, where I'm having to lean the perioprobe way over kind of come in contact, but it, we do have four, four and a half millimeters there. But you can just see kind of how short that prep is. Now, because of the patient's bite, we can't just lengthen these. It's not like we can just do buildups and add to the length of those preparations. This one looks adequate. You know, it's going to be a little bit longer um, than the uh, lateral incisor next to it. So that, that's pretty good reduction. I don't have a problem with that tooth. It's this one. It's this preparation where we don't have a lot of retention. I'm sure where that bridge was wiggling loose. Any thoughts of double abutting it? Well, we've got one of our flipper teeth right here. It does appear that we have a crown here. It looks like there's some separation between the flipper and the crown, but now we're adding two units and maybe what, $2,200 of cost to the bridge for this 76 year old patient who probably just would love to keep it at three units if at all possible. So we really can't build up the preps anymore because of the bite. But if I look at this untrimmed model, I can see the margins on the central incisor pretty clearly. And I can see them pretty clearly on the lateral incisor too. And this is one time where if I don't want to get into crown lengthening, certainly crown lengthening will give us the opportunity to grab onto more uh, tooth structure on both of these. But if we don't want to do that, this is one of the cases where I will go subgingival. Going subgingival, and I mean, I'm always going half a millimeter subgingival. I'm talking two millimeters subgingival here, deep subgingival. It's a periodontal compromise, but I always feel like on a, somebody like a 76-year-old male, that's not the bigger problem. The bigger problem is his front teeth falling out. And so I'm going to go subgingival and grab onto all the tooth I can here, uh, possibly even creating a biologic with violation if we're not going to do the crown lengthening ourselves and send it out to a periodontist. We might only need another millimeter or two of two structure here and then straighten up these walls a little bit to be able to keep this bridge uh, in place. So it looks like we still could take advantage of some sub subgingival two structure and that's going to be our suggestion to the dentist who called and asked and said, hey, what should we do? I've reprepped it, but you know, I'm, I'm open to suggestion. We can't really do a reduction coping for something like that. Um, so we'll have to see how open he is to dropping those margins further subgingival. You could do it here as well because it looks like we have an equigingival 
or maybe just a slightly subgingival in part margin. So there's certainly some more tooth to grab onto there, but it looks like this lateral incisor is the bigger problem out of the two. The other thing would be to make sure that we are in fact using um, as strong of a cement as we can. If you didn't want to use a total etch technique, I would use a um, self etching resin cement. So that's going to have a separate uh, AB primer that needs to be mixed up and put on the two. So that would be Multi-Link Auto Mix from Ivoclar Vivident or Panavia 21F from Curare. Both of those are self etching resin cements that are going to give you the highest bond strength without having to go through all the total etch steps. You would try the bridge into the mouth, make any adjustments you need, decontaminate the inside of the zirconia bridge either with a sandblaster or Ivo Clean from Ivoclar Vivident and leave it in for 20 seconds, rinse it out. Then you would put a zirconia primer in here such as Z Prime Plus for 20 seconds and air thin it um, is a good choice or you could use Monobond Plus from Ivoclar as well, 20 seconds and then air thin it and then go with either of those cements, the Panavia 21F or the Multi-Link Auto Mix, and then bond that onto the two, spot cure it, clean up the excess, and then go through the, the full light cure, and they're both dual cure materials, so they'll cure, cure on their own as well. And that's gonna be about as strong as you can put this on. It's hard to say whether or not it's gonna be enough without lengthening that central incisor, but I guess that's where our no-fault remake rate uh, comes into play. And it's nice when it falls off like this and you don't actually have to uh, uh, cut it all the way off. Um, although I think last time it did take some tooth and then the doctor subsequently built it up and we might be able to see that buildup line right along there. So um, I would prefer if it were me to see this drop down subgingival here. I'm less worried about that than I am about this coming off this uh, poor older gentleman. Again, I'd like to grab onto a little more tooth and then make sure after we try this in, we decontaminate it, use a zirconia primer, and then put it in with the self-etching resin cement, and that should give us our best chance for success. Thank you for that, Dr. You're D. You're welcome. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. We've got a double header for you in Viewer Mail this week, and our first letter uh, comes from Dr. Juan San Martin Jr. and he writes in and says, Hi Dr. Jatola, hope you are doing fine. As you might remember, I'm a Glidewell customer and a dentist in... <laughs> Seriously? Well, I mean, how often do we have dentists that are from s names of Van Halen songs? He's not from just a gigolo. Okay, go ahead, I apologize. Thank you. I've been looking for a product in... <laughs> really? It's a computer. I don't know how to control it. Anyways, well, Juan can't seem to find it. And so he says, I wanted to know if you know that caliper that is used for measuring widths and lengths when doing smile analysis for veneers or crowns. Is it like a cross with color markings? Where can I get it? Also, when placing the veneers and you put the adhesive, is it best not to light cure it until the cement is placed? Best regards from... It hurts. If I could do the splits, I would do it right Please now don't. in super, super tight spandex pants. I'm sorry, Juan. Which I'm already wearing. That's but I would also do the splits for you. Okay. Uh, Juan, what you're asking about is called Choose Proportion Gauge. Let me throw a picture of it up on the screen. It's just you like love on, doing that's like that. on the new Hawaii Five O. Yep. Um, and that's available through Hugh Freedy. And yes, you can use it for golden proportion and measuring all kinds of great things. And um, one of those will last you the rest of your career. And as to the second question, yes, you are correct. Once you put the bonding agent on the inside, wait to cure um, the entire, wait to put the whole thing together before you cure the veneer. Um, the curing lights we have today, extremely powerful things like the Velo, for example, from Ultra Dent. And uh, the materials we have are so thin now, you know, we're able to even do Emacs veneers at three tenths of a millimeter thick so um, you're able to cure that whole layer through the veneer through the silane through the bonding agent through the cement through the other bonding agent right onto the tooth and do it all in one fell swoop in the old days we were more worried about it back in 1995 and so sometimes we'd cure the bonding agent on the tooth first just to make sure we didn't have post-operative sensitivity, but then you gotta worry about the film thickness and whether or not the veneer is gonna seat all the way. So yes, go ahead and just seat the whole thing, quickly spot cure, kind of tack and cure around the gingival, clean up the excess and then cure away. I guarantee you'll see the curing light showing through the lingual aspect of the tooth and there's no need to worry about that, uh, especially on veneers. If it was a thick, 
Brux or Crown, for example, in the posterior, that'd be a different story. And I'd have you use a, a dual cure cement for one thing. Uh, even though we've seen curing lights do penetrate zirconia very well. But for veneers, no big deal. Put it all together and then cure it. So thank you for that. And did you hint that you have a second letter today as well? I do. But before I get to that, I just want to point out that you referred to 1995 as the old days. That's scary. Well, it, it was it was the very beginning. You just for made veneers. me feel old. I want you to know that. <laughs> that oh, I'm sorry about that. I it's apologize. all right. Okay, so yes, our next letter comes from Stuart Rolfe, and he says, "You have said that because of Brexter's strength, you only need 0.6 millimeters of reduction. That reminds me of a lab tech who told me when it came to clearance for a PFM, I could get away with one and a half millimeters, but just because it could be done didn't mean it was a good idea. Two millimeters would be much better. Is that true of Bruxer? Will I get a better contoured crown, better emergence profile, anatomy, etc., if I remove 1.5 to 2 millimeters? Well, that reminds me of a joke, Stuart. A Bruxer crown, an Emacs crown, and a lava crown walk into a bar. And the Bruxer, I, actually, this is a family program. I won't finish this. And the rabbi and the priest hadn't even showed up yet. That's wow. part two of that joke. That's where things really get wild. Um, you are absolutely correct, Stuart. Um, I always try to say that 0.6 millimeters is the minimum material thickness uh, for Bruxer, for solid zirconia. But certainly the ideal thickness is one millimeter. And by ideal, I mean it just allows you to do a little occlusal adjustment on the crown if you need to. At six tenths of a millimeter, if the bite's high on the crown, you have to adjust the opposing or that solid zirconia crown will break. So one millimeter is preferred. I don't know if it's ideal. Uh, if you've seen the hammer test video where we take a Bruxer crown and a hammer and knock it into a two by four and it doesn't break, that's at 1.5 millimeters thick. So to your point, yes, you absolutely get a better result. And at two millimeters, you can, I don't know, drive a steamroller over it and uh, you shoot hockey pucks at it. I'm not sure what you can do. Uh, but 1.5 millimeter gives you that hammer test strength if that's what you're looking for. And yes, you'll get better emergence profile as well. So we often say that uh, Bruxer solid solid zirconia will, will tolerate a feather edge margin, and that's absolutely true, but if you do a chamfer, whether it be a shallow chamfer or a deep chamfer or even a shoulder, you're actually going to get better emergence profile there. And even though Bruxer can be taken to a feather edge, it still can chip when we're milling it and it's that thin if it's like a true knife edge. So even though it can tolerate that, it still can't tolerate it as well as metal, such as cast gold can. So. Yes, even though there are, you know, feather edge minimums and 0.6 millimeter uh, minimums for reduction, if you go above both of those with, say, a millimeter or 1.5 millimeters of reduction and a chamfer margin, the Bruxer will certainly appreciate that during the milling process and will allow you to make occlusal adjustments as well. If you're on a lower second molar, you've got no room and all you can give us is six tenths and a feather edge margin, well then still gonna do better than any other tooth color material, but you're absolutely right. The more reduction you give, whether it's on the occlusal, the axial, or the gingival margin, the better the result you're gonna get. So thank you for bringing that up. I feel like that's a point that we can't stress enough times was we talk so much about the strength, but it turns out thicker is still better. And so what do we have? For two, we have two winners today, we don't do. we? We do. Stuart and Juan both get, well, you go. You lead with the crazy one. Go well, ahead. Well, because of the question about the Bruxer and the thickness and adjusting and polishing it, uh, both these doctors today are going to get uh, the Bruxer uh, adjusting and polishing kit, and hopefully we know how to uh, ship things to, well, the Panama. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> what? See? It's doing it. Ah, YouTube, no! <laughs> That, you couldn't have planned that better. I didn't, yeah, I didn't and I couldn't have and uh, I, frankly it's possessed, I'm a little afraid of yep. it. Yep, and if that wasn't enough, because it's not, uh, you, they definitely need some photographs. Oh, this is, wow. this is lovely. Wow. Look at me, like, just the look of disdain on my face towards you. That's that, sad. Look at me. That I'm, anyway, I, what I, you may not be there, but that's pretty much what I'm going to look like in my coffin. Oh. Except they will have wired my jaw shut. <laughs> but otherwise, that's what no, I think, I'm going to look I think like you dead. might be meditating. <laughs> I did start doing that recently. You did. That's why, if you didn't get the joke of last week of why I was meditating, that's why. Oh, and this one's much better. Yeah, that's gonna have just, to just smiling. We're going to have to flip the coin. Yep. We'll see who that, gets what. Actually, the Panamanian government may not let, it, looks, it appears to be a picture of a corpse. They may not let that in. We might have to Stop keep that it. with Stuart in the U.S. and send the item. No, don't listen to him. All right, well, appreciate that. Thanks to both of you for writing in. We always like seeing your viewer mail. And Megan, have you any news? I have. Parents think it's tougher to get their kids to brush their teeth than to eat vegetables, according to a new survey. 
Nearly half of the parents surveyed said getting their kids to brush their teeth is one of the most challenging things to do, more difficult than getting them to eat their vegetables. The survey also found that most parents say their kids' oral health is poor because they don't brush or floss often enough. This means one thing and one thing only. Right. Sneaky meaties are working. Really? Yes, because Tell they, me more. Well, as you if you've ever watched this show, I talk about sneaky meaties right. where you sneak vegetables into meatballs. Right. And so parents are able to get their kids to eat their vegetables, right. not brush their teeth. Right. So it's too bad you don't have a sneaky brushies. I know, we need that. Um, this would be a good time for you to announce the launch of your product. Well, thank you. I've been waiting. Now we have sneaky meaties. That looks suspiciously like a Biotemps box. I, well, I guess you've decided to portion the entrees the same size as a Biotemps box. Uh huh. All right. And um, with the vegetable surprise filling, um, and there's five sneaky meaties per package. Again, I'm going to ask why isn't it called sneaky veggies? This comes up all the time. Sneaky if, meaties because the meat is being sneaky. Oh, the sneaky meat is being sneaky. Okay. By having the vegetable. Right. Oh, but that's yes. sneaky meat. That's. Disgusting, but um, yeah, so all that to say is that it's easy to get your kids to eat right. vegetables because you can just trick them. Right. Um, well, I, it there's I feel no like tricking them on brushing their teeth. Yes, there is. I Tell made me. my kids brush their teeth with a carrot. What? And put toothpaste on the end of that. You did not. It was so out of the box thinking that I was getting them to eat their vegetables and brush at the same time. Their edible toothbrush as a carrot. Anyways. It's difficult. It's difficult. I do know how to get kids to floss, but I, it's got to be like a 13 year old boy. Or like a 10-year-old girl. Okay. I'll, I'll go up at a hygiene appointment and go behind their last molar and go in and out of there, coat the floss with anaerobes and have them smell it. And they, they, smell, they recognize that smell of anaerobic bacteria from other odors they've experienced them. And I tell them, if you don't floss your teeth to a 13-year-old boy, every girl in the school is going to know about it in about 90 seconds because it's going to spread like wildfire. And that's the only way, right when a boy starts mm -hmm. to care about what girls think, if you can show him how bad his mouth stinks and if you get close to a girl and they ever smell that, it's not you, happening. yeah, you're, you're not going to date, you're not going to go to prom, you're not going to homecoming, you'll live at home with your mother until you're 40, 45. It's nothing but awful things if you yeah. don't take care of that odor that's in your mouth. Sure, but what about little kids? Oh, you can't. I don't know. I, just, I, don't, I don't have a solution for that. Okay. <laughs> I need uh, I need a fair amount of testosterone in their body okay. for my method to work. Well, I haven't thought about the younger ones. I've just given up on the younger ones. There you go. Anything else? Yes. If you're watching this on your lunch break, you might want to put down your fork for this story. A 10-year-old Brazilian girl complained of a tingling sensation in her gums, a feeling that things were moving around. She went to a dental clinic, and what they found was disturbing. The dentist pulled out at least 15 maggots from her gum. This type of infection is rare, but is more likely to occur in developing countries where hygiene and sanitation is worse. Wow, sneaky maggots, sneaky Stop. meat has gone wrong. Is there a video that goes with this? There is. Is it awful or is it just like a I news mean, story? It's, it's pretty, it's, it looks like somebody taking maggots out of somebody's gums. Is it a recreation or did- No, the, it's the actual thing. The dentist whipped out his iPhone? Apparently, because <laughs> the dentist was saying in the story that because it's so rare, they wanted to to film it, and I'm thinking, might just try to cash in on it. I don't wow. know what they're trying to do, but. Um, Let's take a look at it. I want to see it. Okay. <laughs> that, too, too soon. Yep. Okay. That, uh, you know, I've heard nothing that but burns. great, yeah, 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 great thing. Brazil's actually blowing up in terms of dentistry, and there's a lot of great huh. dentists and dentistry being done there, but obviously it's a very poor nation sure. uh, in many parts as well, so I'm glad that, uh, is being, it, it's just, you know, it's just bacteria on a bigger level. Our mouths are all full of bacteria and these are just slightly larger ones. I, I, yep. I honestly, it just, it makes my stomach churn. But really, I, it makes me sad that, um, you know, in these developing countries that there's issues like this, but well, at yeah. least she got the help. And the fact that I, you know, we're not having to treat that in the United States, I'm going to put that on my gratitude list. Yes. I do like the very specific count of 15 maggots, though. I'd be counting, I wonder if too. the assistant was you know, uno, dos. Is he, was he laying them out well, in the circles? Well, they speak yeah. Portuguese in Brazil, so it wouldn't have been that bold. You can't be that far from it. You're yeah. absolutely right, though. Thank you. I know, I blew it. All right, well, that'll about wrap it up for this edition of Chairside Life. For the four of you still watching, on behalf of myself, Megan, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next time.
I'm Dr. Michael Latola. And I'm Megan Strong. In today's case, what did we say? In today's case of the week? On today's Chairside Live? Ready? You're welcome. <laughs> La 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 la. Hi, Dr. Detola. Hope you are doing fine. He is. As a, as in my, I made myself mess up. Sneaky if, meaties because the meat is being. Oh, the sneaky meat is being sneaky. Okay. By having the vegetables. Right. Oh, but that's yes. sneaky meat. 